So the gift is delivered to you, and deliverance comes from those roots that mean to turn something over and to let it go. And, and as we cast our prayer, our Christmas prayer, over upon our spiritual higher power, we set ourselves free, and we set our answer free, and what we receive is always something a little different than we had in mind, isn't it? But it's always got that X, that, that X factor, that extra God something in it, right? Um, really, this brings us to, to the last story of the Christmas season. We're starting our Christmas season with the very end of the Christmas season, and you probably don't even know this story, because by the time the story comes around back in the original story, about a month or two after the birth of Jesus, we've moved on to other things, so it's never talked about. But how many of you know about Anna and Simeon? Anna and Simeon. A few people do. Not many. And the reason why is because... Uh, we're usually in, like this took place maybe 30 days, maybe 40 days, maybe 60 days after the time of Jesus' birth. But I want to start with it because it talks about the attitude that it takes to recognize the gift when it comes. You know, we're, we're holding a courageous spiritual prayer, a courageous spiritual step in our hearts. And God honors your sacred desires. God honors your desires of your heart. And every desire of your heart in the fullness of time, maybe not even in this lifetime, but in the fullness of time is fulfilled. And so your sacred desire is, is being gestated, is being worked through. But, it, but we don't always recognize it. As I, as I shared during the meditation, um, Emerson said, if the stars only shone in the sky once in a century, the whole world would be outside in awe, looking upwards all night. And yet, it's not that big of a deal to us, because... We don't, we don't have the eyes to recognize it. We don't, we don't see it. We don't have the openness. And so what attitude does it take to receive the starry sky of your, of your spiritual vision, of your, of your courageous spiritual step? I am open and receptive to my courageous spiritual step. Together, I am open and receptive to my courageous spiritual step. Just get into that consciousness that's open. What does it take? It takes the attitude of Anna and Simeon, and I want to talk about these two. They're, um, they're little known, but they're powerful. You know, Jesus' Jesus's birth was only recognized by two people who were really considered to be observant in his culture, Anna and Sim Simeon. They were only recognized during that period of time by anybody outside of the Holy Family. And uh, you think, well, what about the shepherds? Well, the shepherds were ritually unclean and weren't allowed in the temple in Jerusalem. And yet... The shepherds did see the starry sky, right? And they heard the choirs of angels. But isn't it weird that nobody else heard the choirs of angels? Nobody else noticed? Why? Because the shepherds were quiet. They, they, they just sat there all night watching their sheep. And do we have the quietness, the quietness to hear, to see? And then what about the magi? Well, they were foreigners. They were Zoroastrian astrologer priests. And yet... They looked up at the sky, they saw the stars, but they saw it in a more of a spiritual understanding way, more in terms of knowledge. But not everybody could see that either. They were the only ones who showed up. And yet there, there are only really two, though. Well, really only two of their culture who were allowed in the temple in Jerusalem who could bear witness to the birth of Jesus and see it for what it was. And uh, they're Anna and Simeon. Now, they're known as quietists. And a quietist is what? Somebody who got quiet. Imagine, in Jesus' day, they had as much religion dissension, religious dissension as we do today. They had different denominations and schools of religious thought. They had the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes and a whole bunch of other groups, and they all disagreed with each other. But the quietists didn't get into all that. You know, do you have something in your life that keeps trying to draw you into the, into the drama, the politics of the world, or your family? <laughs> Dynamics, You know, I don't need this drama. I'm a quietist. Together, I don't need this drama. I'm a quietist. They didn't caught, get caught up in the divisions. The divisions. You know, we think our religion makes us so special. I remember a classmate of mine, my best friend in ministerial school. He grew up in the Ozarks in a family that was in a church that was that he was raised in that, that told him from a very early age we're the only church of Jesus, the only true church, because we're the church that Jesus himself founded. And everybody else is wrong. And they're all going to hell, but we're, we're the only true 
church. And then he was a genius. He was a brilliant, brilliant boy. Nobody in his family ever even graduated from high school, let alone he went to college and got a graduate degree. But later, but here he was, 12 years old, and he goes to the library in the nearest town and he starts reading and he finds out that his denomination was founded in 1833. <laughs> so he takes this information to his minister and he's called a troublemaker. And from then on he went, yeah, nothing to see here, I just pass it by. And he started searching in his life and it led him to becoming a unity minister. My point is that, is that we have all these divisions in life, but something holds us in common, and that is the truth at the essence in the quiet. The quietists, and in Simeon, they didn't argue, they didn't divide, they didn't separate. Where in your life is there that quiet center, that sacred center, that can recognize your answer when it comes? Because nobody else in the temple in Jerusalem recognized the Holy Family or Jesus. Let's start with, uh, with Simeon. Simeon represents the flexibility a vision, the ability to see your answer, even when it doesn't look like you think it's going to look. You know, your answer, what would you do if your answer is wrapped up in different Christmas wrapping, different paper? What if your answer shows up, then you, different paper than you expected, wrapped up differently? And this was really what happened here. Everybody was expecting a great warrior king who was going to rule over everybody, and everybody would recognize this, and it's a baby. It's a baby. What an improbable paradoxical answer to the prayer that had been prayed for hundreds of years. The prophecies, all these the grandiose things, and if you read those, you know, all the great prophecies, these great grandiose things, and yet it's a baby. Your answer, you say, my answer, my spiritual growth, my spiritual step, it will come like a baby. Yes. And what is it about a baby? You've got to take care of a baby. You say, I've got to take care of my spiritual step. I've got to take care of that Christ consciousness that's born in me, my, my answer to my prayer. Yes, it's such a sacred and special thing. Yet, it can't be born, it can't, be, it can't grow up without your protection, your, your, your cherishing, your nurturing. You've got to recognize it for what it is. And your answer always shows up in the most improbable ways. Simeon. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by this Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. And he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. For my eyes have seen your salvation, a light to bring revelation to the whole world and glory to your people Israel. It's a universal answer. Your, your prayer, you say, well, I'm praying for something. It's my spiritual step, but it's a universal answer. You really want more than just the, the confines of your particular vision. You know, you, you can't limit your vision. It's going to bless everybody. It's going to do things that you have no idea. It's going to have, it's going to be wrapped in different paper. It's going to be a universal gift. And, and this is what Simeon was saying. It's not some narrow sectarian religious thing. You've got to move past religion to spirituality. You've got to move past uh, belief systems to an experience. You've got to move past that, uh, your own definitions to something that has no definition at all. It, it's infinite, infinite, infinite spirit. Infinite spirit. And this is what this baby represented. And, and think about it in your life. Um, I'm going to take the most mundane example. High school graduation. You know, you, you work for, for 12, 13 years of your life to try to get a diploma and to be in a ceremony so that you can wear a cap and gown and graduate. And isn't it about the diploma and the cap and gown? No. It's about all the growth that you had to go through to get to that point. It's about everything you had to learn, all the different experiences, including sometimes be having to go to detention and not and maybe not getting all the grades you wanted and not maybe not getting asked to the prom or all those different experiences, but it's all part of the whole. It's not about the end result, it's about the experience of it. You possess everything. You have ownership of everything in the universe. It's all on loan to you. And yet, 
And yet, it's the essence of everything you're praying for. He went on to talk about how when we get an answer to prayer, there's a process involved. A prayer isn't an end result, it's a process of unfoldment. Just like you're not an end result, you're a process of unfoldment. The universe is constantly unfolding and you're a big part of it. Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of Jesus. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the rising and the fall of many in Israel, and even a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will even pierce through your own soul also, that the secret thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The secret thoughts of many hearts. That means that your heart has secret thoughts, things that you need to let go of, things that are limitations, things that you're holding on to that you need to cast on to God and go free. I cast this burden on God and I go free. Together, I cast this burden on God and I go free. And the piercing of your heart sounds like a terrible thing, but it's a beautiful thing because what do you get when you get a pierced heart? You get an open heart. What do you get when you get a pierced heart? You open that, that, that heart. And it feels... It may feel like the piercing of a heart, but it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It opens you to, to, the, to the universal glory, the universal answer to your prayer that's going to benefit everyone. It's not going to take the form you have in mind, and yet it will include the essence of everything you have in mind. You know, I, this is a, a silly uh, uh, example, but I, 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 I was with a friend of mine about 35, 40 years ago, I lived in Los Angeles. He was visiting. And he said, I want to see the Hotel California. In the song. And I said, well, I think they based it on the Beverly Hills Hotel. So we drove to the Beverly Hills Hotel. And we got out. Now, we weren't going to eat there. It was a little expensive. And we certainly weren't going to stay there. But, you know, you could walk around. And we had the best time. We walked around saying, I own this place. This place is mine. See that palm tree? That's my palm tree. See that bungalow? I own that bungalow. I'm, I, we really did this, and we had the best time. Because you own it all. You own it all, but it doesn't limit you. Now, look, look outside. Look at, the, look at that snow globe out there. You live in this magnificent snow globe. You own it all. You own it all. You know, sometimes the answer to your prayer, you've got to be flexible. You've got to be flexible like Simeon so you can recognize it. Rick Steves, you know the, the guy who travels in Europe and all that? He talked about how you got to be flexible when you receive your bed in Europe. He says, if the bed's too short, you're too tall. You know, you've got to be open. I had somebody between services say to me, yes, I'm praying my prayer that tomorrow morning it'll be 80 degrees. <laughs> no, no, no. You're in Chicago. Let your prayer be, thank you, God, for the perfect coat. You know? Be open to receive in the most wonderful way. There's going to be great opportunities for you. You are, you know, I, I've fallen in love with that book, Oh, The Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. You have destinies. You have visions. But it includes things that, uh, you know, are a little bit, little bit, you know, like, like this story here. Uh, there'll be a fall and rising of many and a sign that we've spoken against. You say, how can my answer be anything that people sp speak against? Well, have you ever talked to your family lately? You know, or have you ever looked around you in the world? There's always going to be somebody who's not going to like it, but you've got to, you've got to be simian. You've got to hold that vision. You've got to be the quietest. You've got to be the person who doesn't hold the, you know. We've got, we got three religious science ministers here. We don't argue theology, do we? No! You call it treatment. I call it prayer. My religious science friend, Helen Street, we used to call it trading or pray, uh, praying or prating. You know, trading, <laughs> praying. It's all the one same thing. You're open. You're wide open. You gotta open. It's opener there in the wide open air, as it says in Oh, the places you'll go. You gotta get open. So Simeon represents a spirit that is open, flexible. You gotta have it. The other thing is Anna. Anna. She represents um, being patient. And another word for patience is faith. And what is faith? Faith is, Charles Wilmer says, the perceiving power of the mind, the ability to envision even when it's not there yet. Uh, in Hebrews it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hasn't shown up yet. Hasn't shown up yet. But you're, but you're holding it. You have a starry sky. Maybe it's covered with clouds. Maybe it's daytime. Maybe there's a big moon. You can't see it. Maybe you're in the middle of the city. 
but they're always there. It's always there. Your answer is already there in the mind of God. My answer is already there in the mind of God. Together? My answer is already there in the mind of God. And I'm patient in receiving. Together? And I'm patient in receiving. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband for seven years until he died. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years of age who didn't depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in at that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him of him to all those who look for redemption in Jerusalem. Now this is that... They built, she, just, she just came back day after day. He said, I don't want to be 84 years old, coming back day after day, fasting and praying. This is talking about an attitude of your heart. This is talking about an attitude of your mind. Because at any given now moment, you already receive in the mind of God, in the fullness of time, it will outpicture, outform, but it's already there in the wide open air. You've got to be open. You've got to be open and, and, and patient. You have to have that patience. You know, I remember... Gosh, I remember uh, when I was in my late teens, I had a terrible problem with hypoglycemia. Just terrible. I mean, I'd be, by 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning after eating breakfast, I would be, you know, seeing spots before my eyes. And so I prayed, and I did my prayer work every day. And I was guided. I was guided to eat bananas. I, I carried bananas with me everywhere to get the potassium and a little bit of carbs. And I, they called me the banana kid. You know, but I had to change my lifestyle because my lifestyle was going 90 miles an hour or crashing, 90 miles an hour or crashing. I had to balance myself. And it took three years, three years of daily prayer, three years of visualization and prayer and all that before I overcame it. But you hold, you hold in faith. You hold in faith. You keep, you're faithful. You're faithful and true. You have a true heart. And you realize that the purpose of your prayer is not necessarily to get the graduation, the cap and gown, the answer. It's about the process of unfoldment that it engenders within you. You are one with the process of unfoldment. It's coming through you. It's always pushing out, pushing out through you. Remember in the secret gospel of James, when Mary says, get me down from this donkey. That which is inside me is pushing out mightily, wanting to get out. Now, there's, what is it trying to get out in you? What are you gestating and are going to give birth to? A spiritual something. You think it's a, a divine answer that you're holding in prayer, and it is, but there's something more. It's that potential that's inside of you. It is that secret something, that sacred presence that's in your heart of hearts, and it's, it's coming out of you in, 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 in the fullness of time. But when the time is right, you let go into it. You just let go into it. And it is something that you will be supported in. So think about now. Think about that, that sacred prayer that you're holding. Think for a moment about what it's going to take for that courageous spiritual step. It's going to take a flexibility of vision like Simeon. It's going to take the eyes to see like the shepherds in the Magi. It's going to take the patience and the faith that's willing to hold. And it's going to take that willing to cast the burden onto God, that deliverance, which is that letting go, turning it over, and trusting, and going free. Well, I'm run out, I've run out of stuff to say. i got more to say, but I'm not going to say it. Because <laughs> we're, su we're supposed to take it into prayer right now. So I want you to just take this into prayer. I want you to just... Take a deep, deep breath and let it out. And just say, I cast this prayer on God and I go free. Together, I cast this prayer onto God and I go free. And feel yourself once again out in that field with the stars above you. I cast this prayer onto God and I go free. The fulfillment of my heart's desire, my heart of hearts. Knowing that it's the process of unfoldment, the growth. I am a growing soul. I'm a good person, a good soul, growing in this universe. And I embrace it all as I grow into my right answer. I embrace all the appearances that I judge positively, negatively, whatever. I open my heart to embrace it all. I let my heart be pierced. And 
and I cast all of my limited thinking on God and I go free. I cast all circumstances, and anything, any thoughts I have, any feelings, onto God and I go free. And I revel in the richness of this starry sky, this open space. Silence speaks more than any words. I am a quietist. Thank you, God. And so it is. Take a deep breath and let it out. And just let go into this moment. And realize this is a time of deliverance. It's no accident that they said Mary was expecting a baby. Because the birth of the deliverance of Israel was an expectation of something greater, something higher. And the birth of our prayer, our deliverance, is something we expect in our heart of hearts. And so just kind of open your hands and let go of whatever's in your hands. Open your thoughts. Let them flow freely. Open your feelings. Let them just be light. And take another deep breath and let it out in this moment. And take that prayer that you're holding during this spiritual season. That courageous spiritual step. The dream of your heart. God honors our sacred desires. And in this sacred moment that we share together, we place our gestating dream, our spiritual, courageous step into the care and keeping of our Creator, our spiritual essence. We take those wonderful words of Florence Goldblum, I cast this prayer on God and I go free. I cast this prayer on God and I go free. And we let go into this moment so we can get out of the way of whatever needs to be delivered in our lives. Deliverance. Turning something over, setting it free. Cast this on God and I go free. And if there's anything that seems to be a burden in your heart, just say, I cast this burden on God and I go free. This is my deliverance. Any people, places, or things. I cast this on God and I go free. And anything that looks like a limitation, I cast this on God, I go free. Feel the freedom in your heart and your soul. Feel the freedom within your very being. And now imagine In this sacred space that you are out in the open, in a space where there are no human lights, it could be in the desert or in a field or at the top of a mountain, but you're looking up, it's nighttime and there are a million stars. 
You can even make out the streak of the Milky Way through the sky. There's no moon, so every star sings out, stands out. And you remember that in ancient times, they believed that every star was an angel. And so when the shepherds heard the heavenly host singing, they really thought it was the stars that were singing. Lift up your eyes, lift up your heart, lift up your inner hearing. Emerson said, if the stars only shone once in a century, the whole world would be outside all night and all looking up. These stars are always here. Your answer is already here in the mind of God. Your answer shines forth, sings out. Lift up your heart and hear it. Lift up your eyes and see it. Embrace. Take ownership of the whole starry sky of the answer of your sacred spiritual step, your sacred desire. And just take it in. Starlight, star bright. Star shining down upon us now. Sacred star of our heart, our heart's desire. Give us the eyes to see the answer when it comes and the patience, the patient faith. all the different appearances. We take ownership of this sacred starry sky. Now we, we're going to place our spiritual essence into our offering. So, so I place my spiritual essence into my offering and I receive abundantly. Together, I place my spiritual essence into my offering and I receive abundantly and silently. And again, aloud together. I place my spiritual essence into my offering and I receive abundantly. And so it is. Thank you, God. Amen.